Thank you for listening in to Conversations with Alice and Jay, The Journey to Hear. Please remember to subscribe, hit the like button and share. Hello and welcome to another episode of Conversations with Alice and Jay, The Journey to Hear. I'm your host, Alice and Jay. Today we'll be speaking about adoption. We'll be speaking with Rita Sornan, who is the CEO of the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. The Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption is the only public nonprofit charity in the United States that is focused exclusively on foster care adoption. Through its signature program, Wendy's Wonderful Kids, the foundation funds adoption professionals known as recruiters who are dedicated to finding loving permanent homes for children waiting in foster care. The foundation works closely with child welfare advocates and policymakers, provides free resources about foster care adoption and raises awareness through social media campaigns, public service announcements and events. Their mission is to dramatically increase the number of adoptions of children waiting in North America's foster care systems. Their vision is for every child to have a permanent home and loving family. Their story began in 1990 when Dave Thomas, founder of Wendy's, accepted President George H.W. Bush's invitation to be the spokesperson for a national adoption awareness campaign. However, Dave knew he could do more. In 1992, he established the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. Over the years, Dave's modest charisma and simple sincerity helped spread the word about adoption. And in 1997, he testified before Congress to support an adoption tax credit that aimed to make adoption more affordable. He also appeared in public service announcements, expanded his reach to Canada and led the initiative to create an adoption stamp, which was issued by the US Postal Service in the year 2000. On January 8, 2002, Dave sadly passed away and the world lost one of its greatest advocates for children. Dave Thomas was respected for being a talented businessman and a caring philanthropist. His uneasing desire to improve the lives of children in North America was arguably his greatest contribution to society. For more than 25 years, the foundation has continued its pursuit of Dave's goal of finding forever families for children in foster care. His unceasing desire to improve the lives of North America's most vulnerable children was arguably his greatest contribution to society. For more than 25 years, the foundation has continued its pursuit of Dave's goal of finding forever families for children in foster care. Rita Sornan, thank you so much for joining us here on Conversations with Alice and Jay, The Journey to Hear. Welcome. Hello, good afternoon. Alison, how are you? Well, thank you for having me a part of your podcast. This is this is really exciting. It um if I just a little bit of a personal story for me. Adoption and fostering is something that is very dear to my heart because the way that I grew up, I grew up in a West Indian culture where it wasn't called fostering or anything like that. But you did have, so for example, with me, it was um, the lady that raised me, because my mum got pregnant with me very young. Mm -hmm. So the lady that raised me was somebody that my grandmother, my grandparents and our families knew each other, went all the way back to Jamaica. They were in England together and so on. So you didn't quite call it fostering. Yeah, yep. But it was a very similar environment. Sure, sure. And then that same... Um, I call her my aunt, but we're not biologically related. But And she then became qualified to be a childminder. So I was always around children, lots of other children. And then moving further down in my own life, I struggled with um, infertility. So that is, and when the condition was first diagnosed, my ex-husband said to me, don't worry, we can always adopt. Now, I've never been opposed to adoption, sure. but I didn't want it to look like I'm now <clears throat> substituting because yes. that's not what it, it was about for me. Yep. And, a co and then I got to find out how many people I knew 
who had adopted their children and I never knew. Looking at, honestly, if you look at all of them, you would never know yep, that yep. they because they look alike and just just so many things. And she said to me, her epiphany was one day when she was um really lamenting about not being a mother. And a friend of her says, Is it that you want to be pregnant or do you want to be a mum? And it was when she said that, I was she said that blew her mind. And as she was telling me that, the truth of it is, quietly, silently, my mind was blowing also. Because exactly. it, it was like, that's true. Yes, it would be great to have that whole experience, pregnancy experience, giving birth experience. But what is the fundamental? Is it that you just want that experience? You know, a bit like those people that want the big wedding and forget there's an actual marriage behind yeah, it. Exactly. Or do you want motherhood, family? And that was like yeah I actually want motherhood so in doing these podcasts and I had spoken to a lady um about fostering and I really wanted and then I watched a movie for the life of me I can't remember the name of it now and then your website came up at the end of the movie Ah, well yeah and I looked because it was about um this woman I think she was a teacher and she was, she fostered to, she was an African-American woman and she fostered to um, Caucasian children. And because they were looking at no um, African-American children should be with Af- in African-American households and so on. And she went to the courts and she really fought for these children and ended up winning and adopting them. And then at the end, I'm so glad I watched credits. I'm a bit nerdy like that. (laughs) Otherwise I would have completely missed it. And that's how your website came up. So, and I reached out and I bless her. She's a wonderful woman, Mary Ellen. We've been communicating and liaising. And um, so when I got the email that you had agreed, I was running through the house. (laughs) Because I just think that there's some things that we need to talk about more. And I believe fostering and adoption is one of those things because we hear about all these celebrities traveling to all these countries and adopting a child and bringing them back home. But the reality is we have so many right in our own backyard, so many children that are in need of a home. And the truth is there are so many homes that actually want the children. They just don't know how to go about it. So I'm Rita, yes, and I hope I pronounced your name correctly. I Rita Sornan. Yep, perfect. Oh, wonderful. Rita Sornan from the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. Thank you so much for joining us here on Conversations with Alison Jay, The Journey to Here. Thank you so much and welcome. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here and really excited to have a conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So Rita, first and foremost, the Dave Tom- Thomas Foundation, if you can say, tell us, what does the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption do? Of course. Well, the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption is a national nonprofit public charity, and we really singularly focus on one mission, and that mission is to dramatically increase the adoptions of children from North America's foster care system. So we ha- actually have two foundations, one here in the United States and one in Canada. Um, but our job is to do two things. To first raise awareness about the fact that children are in foster care. What are the circumstances? How do children get there? What does the system look like? Because I think it seems very complex to people that, that might be thinking about um, the foster care system. So raise awareness in that conversation about children in foster care and children waiting to be adopted. And then we've developed evidence-based programs that aggressively move children out of foster care and into adoptive homes. So first raise awareness, engage the public in that conversation, help us all understand better who these children are and why they're in foster care. But we couldn't just stop there, although we did that almost exclusively for a number of years when we were first formed. But the second part is to really put some action behind those words and make sure children can have permanent homes. Just one more thing, our our foundation was created by Dave Thomas, who was also the founder of the Wendy's brand, that Wendy's hamburger and Frosty brand, the the, the iconic brand. And he created the foundation um, because he was adopted and it was something near and dear to his heart, the conversation. And he also understood in 1992 when he created this foundation, 
that um, he uniquely identified and understood there was a gap in this country at that point about a conversation about children in foster care waiting to be adopted. So he wanted to fill that gap. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And that is so awesome to hear that, that somebody that so well known and he didn't have to but the fact that he turned around and paid it forward because of his own experience and what he went through and something that you mentioned about raising awareness because it's it's so strange when you actually think about it everybody knows what adoption is yes everybody knows what fostering is but yet it's still this thing that seems to be an enigma in the world because and I don't know even how true it is, so to speak, but from the research that I have done, it seems as though in some cases there's a lot of bureaucracy and red tape. Do you think that could be why people just stare away from it and think, oh, no, it's too complicated. I just don't want to. We know that's one of the reasons. We also know there are myths and misperceptions that surround children and families in care. For example, we do research every few years to just get a pulse of Americans and Canadians' attitudes toward foster care and foster care adoption. And one piece of information that still kind of punches me a little bit when I think about it is a majority of Americans believe children are in care because they've done something wrong, because they're juvenile delinquents. So we, if we ascribe fault to these children, then it's not something we want to engage in if we think they're perhaps too old, too damaged, too dangerous to to even think about, you know, how can I be a part of that? Well, we know nothing could be farther from the truth. Children are in foster care because they've been abused or neglected or abandoned. Um, It's not because they've done anything wrong. They may have issues there's layers of trauma that are on these children. First, the, the abandonment, the, 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 the sense of um, grief and loss that they feel when they are taken from their families. Frequently, they move multiple times in foster care, and so that creates other layers of trauma. Um, and so we have to understand that there may be some behaviors with teens in foster care that uh, in addition to just being teens that that are the result of the, the experience that they've had. And so I think, part of our job has been to engage that conversation about, yes, there are right now today, as we're talking, there are 423,000 children in foster care. Our goal is to get those children home if we can. Children should thrive and can thrive best in their family of origin. But if that family can't, can't be safe enough for that child at some point, and they're permanently severed from that family, and right now, there are 122,000 of those children in care in the United States who can no longer go home, then our job is to, our promise is to get them into a family. And so, yes, it is a bureaucratic system. It's a government system. It can be fraught with, you know, people who are overwhelmed with numbers and not enough resources, but they are children in these systems. And so our our message is we have to leap over the discomfort of what may be a, a governmental bureaucracy and find out how we can get engaged. And we have to leap over those misperceptions about who these children are. And remember, you're right, they're right here in our community. There are children. Dave Thomas used to say all the time, these children are not someone else's responsibility. They're our responsibility. And so we try and engage people in that sense of of ownership of of, um, the issue and the children in care. And I like what you said there, that we have to leap over all of that and really focus on the end result. The end goal is that there are children in need of a loving, caring, nurturing home. And there's so many people that can provide that. And it's such a shame that it is so bureaucratic and the red tape. But then on the other hand, you do have to make sure that these children are going into a safe environment. So it's almost like a catch-22 situation. And I really like what you said there about who these children are. It's... um, very interesting because I went through a course I can't give the name of the course because then it will give the name of the company away but it's it talks about seeing people as people and not as objects it talks about the inward and the outward mindset so you saying that about who these children are just reminded me of that because if we actually think about it even if there were children that were juvenile delinquents. I don't believe they were born that way. Right. Some, a lot of them are that way because of survival, 
because of the environment some of them may have been brought up in. And I think, so no, and of course, nobody wants to invite trouble into their home, but maybe if we were a little bit more understanding at this is just the manifestation perhaps of a trauma that they've endured and it's manifesting itself in them running away. But then on another side of that, if they were in a safe, healthy environment, maybe they wouldn't have run away because there'd be nothing to run away from. So they wouldn't be the delinquency as um, label placed on them. So it's so interesting about the children and just being there. And so would you say then really that this is not really for the faint of heart because there may well be some challenges that you have to help these children work through and kind of be prepared to be patient and loving and understanding in helping them. Which, frankly, when you think about it, is the role of any parent, right? Whenever you're a parent, whether you're a biological parent or an adoptive parent, or maybe even just a, a substitute parent as a family member, your job is to advocate for this child in school, in for their health care, um, for their for their safe circumstances. It's elevated a bit when you step into a system to to then adopt a child, of course. So yes, not for the faint of heart, but I think bringing out the best of of a. Uh, parental mode um, is what it's all about because we we always want the best for our children no matter how those children come into our family. Absolutely and that's an excellent point no matter how they come into our family we want the best for children and that is that's really that is so true and I was looking at your website and I saw that you have the Wendy's Wonderful Kids program. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a bit about the history of that? Sure. Um, I think I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, when we first started in 1992, the most of our work, we, we counted on Dave Thomas's celebrity and we used him in public service announcements and he, he walked the halls of Congress and helped with policy issues, but it was mostly awareness work that we were doing. But around 2001, 2002, if you had come to me and said, Rita, how many children did you help get adopted today? I wouldn't have been able to tell you. We were making some grants to national organizations as a grant making organization and helping support their efforts. We were doing incredible awareness campaigns. But at the end of the day, behind our mission to dramatically increase the adoptions of children out of foster care is something measurable. And we couldn't measure how we were impacting children specifically. We also knew there were gaps in the system so that we always talk about the numbers of children in foster care, the numbers of children waiting to be adopted, but there's another number that drives us. And that's the number of children who turn 18 in foster care and leave without an adoptive family, they age out of care, 20,000 children. And that number has stayed about the same year over year over year. And yeah. so what was it that was keeping those children from having the family that we promised them the day that we terminated their parental rights from their biological family? Our promise was that we would find them a family, but we failed 20,000 times year over year. So we stepped in and we began, we kind of went underground for a couple of years and reformatted our strategic thinking and looked at what were some of the best practices out there for working with those children most at risk of aging out of care, and it's a really very specific focus population, children aged nine and older. Research shows us that the day a child turns nine in foster care, the likelihood of them being adopted decreases significantly. And think about a nine-year-old, they're still a child. Yeah. They still have the hope and promise of every child, no mm -hmm. matter what their age, but nine is awfully young to be giving up on children children in sibling groups, children with special needs, um, children who've been in care for so long, four or five or six or seven years, that when efforts are made on their behalf, they push back. They, they resist efforts at permanency for all the right reasons. They have no reason to trust systems or adults in because of the circumstances of their lives. So we began to look at how do we serve that population of children better? And we pulled together a program that we called child-focused recruitment, but we branded it Wendy's Wonderful Kids because our Wendy's partners, franchisees, okay. stepped forward and began fundraising for us in their restaurants. And what we said was, we'll use those funds, we'll send them back to the community in which they were raised and begin to work with organizations who can hire full-time 
adoption professionals who can put in place this model we've created and let's see if it at least works better than business as usual. And let's try and get these children most at risk of aging out of care adopted. And it's a really simple model when you think about it. It's just good social work. Carry a small caseload of children, get to know the children on their, your caseload do a deep dive into the child's case file because you're going to find natural potential adoptive parents from former foster parents to extended family members to best friends, families, teachers, all kinds of adults surround these children. But if they haven't been asked or if they if they haven't been followed up on to potentially adopt, then we've lost them as potential adoptive resources. So we started out as a pilot project in 2004 in seven sites. And today we are funding in excess, nearly 500 adoption professionals across the United States and Canada um, who are using this model. And just a couple of months ago, we celebrated 10,000 adoptions of just that, that very population that we were talking about of, of older youth, children and sibling groups, children with special needs, 10,000 adoptions through the Wendy's Wonderful Kids program. So we're really proud of that, but we know we still have a lot of children waiting. And so we're working to scale that program and make sure that every child that, that can be best served by this program has the opportunity for that. That is wonderful that you were able to turn that around. And I'm glad you mentioned aging out because to be honest, I first heard of aging out about eight years ago, mm -hmm. a company that I worked for, they were very heavy in philanthropic efforts. And one of them, every Christmas, we did a, a toy, we did a toy drive. And so, you know, the toy drive, you buy an unwrapped gift for a specific um, if it's male child or female child of a certain age. And then there was a section of that where we were asking for a specific amount of donations for aging out children. And I had never heard of aging out children before. So when I asked the charity that we were working with, what is aging out and what do they do? And they told me what they use those funds for to, to buy them household items to help set them up because they can no longer keep them in foster care because they, they've become too old. And I just thought to myself, and then I started to ask them, some of those children, have they at what ages were they in foster care? And to hear that some of them have pretty much been in foster care the majority of their lives. And so now that you've said that, it makes sense to me because obviously as they've gotten older from nine upwards, nobody was looking at that age group. Yeah. So it makes so much sense now that you've explained it. So thank you for that. And it really is quite, when you think about it, heartbreaking. Because I think about... Um, the nine and 10 year olds I have around me. And I, they're still babies to me, <laughs> in my mind. Exactly. I, they're still babies. I, I have a 10 year old goddaughter and we do re reading over Zoom twice a week. And she showed me her, her dolls and things like that. So she's still at that age of dolls. So to think that that child's too old Exactly, exactly. Or an 18 year old, you know, think of yourself at 18. Yes. Um, you know, 18 is that time when we should be testing and trying and asserting our independence and wanting to be on our own. But the reality is, think of, think about yourself at 18 when you're, if you were completely on your own and you had to, you know, get, your, get, get a place to live and make sure you have transportation and, and, and figure out your own network of support, if at all. And so what we see is that children who age out of care, not because they're bad kids, but because they don't have that safety net of family, you know, have are at higher risk of negative consequences, homelessness, substance abuse, you know, being undereducated, unemployed, again, because what we do with our 18 year olds that are in thriving families is we help them get to that next step. We help them get to college or we help them find an apartment. We, we let them come back to us if they're, you know what, I, I, can't, I can't seem to make it this month. Come back and live with us until we can get you back on your feet. Mm -hmm. But children who age out of care don't have that option. Or even if they get themselves to college, right? Think about when the college closes down at holiday time or summertime, if they're not enrolled in school, you can't stay in the, in the dorm. You have no place to go. And so you're couch surfing with friends or, or whatever it is. So that we allow that to happen in this country is, is unconscionable. And that's why we're working really hard to make sure it doesn't happen. Wow, that is 
to thinking about all those things. There's so much to to take in and unpack that never even yeah. thought of. Never it's that that part, that college part, they don't have a family to go to during holidays. It's my Rita, you've just given me so much to think about and to just pause for a moment and because my heart just does really go out to those children because you've got to admit there's so many of us that are completely oblivious to things yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, we just haven't thought about it or had it mm -hmm. circle our lives. But as soon as you know about it, it feels like, and not everybody can foster, not everybody wants to adopt or foster or has the means or, and we're not saying everybody should, but everybody can be aware, talk yeah. about it wherever they're gathered at, at, at places of employment or places of worship or wherever they're in their neighborhood, talk about this issue advocate for children, um, become a volunteer, become a mentor. There are all kinds of ways to assist without going that that extra length and perhaps fostering or adopt. But we want people to do that too, if they're so inclined. Yes, but, but I'm glad you mentioned that because at least people can have it in their minds. It's like, okay, I may not be in the position to adopt. I may not be in the, the position to foster, but there's still something I can do. I can- exactly. I can volunteer, right? There's just so many things that can be done, like you said, to raise awareness, because I really think that if we raise awareness to things, that could be a part of the battle won, because it's putting it in people's consciousnesses. So we're not so dismissive, because I think if we, now that we think about it, I think we've all heard of that child that was always hanging around some other friend's house. Yes. But we never stop to think why. <laughs> and it could literally right, be because... Right. And children... No, sorry, you were saying? No, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I'm just no children say... don't want to talk about their circumstances, mm -hmm. right? So there may be someone in the neighborhood who's a foster youth, and you're just not sure what's going on, or they don't want to talk about it at school. Mm -hmm. They don't want to draw attention to themselves. So you're right. It's just being, being eyes open and keenly aware. Yeah. My goodness, thank you for that, because I can safely say now that if I come across a young person and during the holidays they're asking, oh, can we just come and stay? There could be more behind it, not just, why is that friend always coming over? Because, <laughs> and you mm -hmm. know, and sometimes as parents, because you've got so much on your plate, you could be forgiven for thinking, why is that kid always here? Don't they have a home yeah. to go to? <laughs> Because have, how, have we all not heard or even said sometimes that particular expression? Why are they always here? Don't they have a home to go to? And the sad reality could be actually, no, they don't. Yeah, exactly. And the fact that children are always looking for role models. They're always looking for people that can provide them support. They may not be as um, conscious of that, but, but I think as humans, we seek that out. Who's most supportive of who we are mm -hmm. and what we do. And so absolutely to open your heart and your home, um, to a child that may be in that quest is, is maybe one of the, the best things we can do as adults. Yes, that is so true. And I met, saw on the website that Wendy's wonderful kids program, you focus on children with special needs. So are, is that also a group of children that are also difficult to place into foster care and adoption? They are, when you think about it, you know, first of all, I think People, when people are thinking about adopting that first blush is you just in your consciousness, you think infant adoption, whether it's domestic infant or international infant, right? And then as be, people become more aware of the options, then they think about, okay, well, maybe foster care is an option. But they typically aren't walking in the door saying, well, I'd like to adopt a sibling group of three. And hopefully one of those children has, uh, you know, a medical special need that I'll have to spend lots of extra time managing. And so it takes a, a particular kind of both conversation and person stepping forward that really does either has the knowledge, has had experience with perhaps a special need child in the past, or just has the willingness and the care to say, I will take on the extra work that this might take. And again, I think back to if, if a child was born to a family that had special needs, then you would, you, would, you would find a way to manage that. You would advocate for everything that that child needed. So it's just a little bit of a short leap to say, I can do that same for a child I didn't know from birth 
but now I know and now needs that special help. But yes, most people will put up, unless they are really comfortable with it, they'll think, I don't, you know, I, and I want people to honestly assess what can they manage in their lives. I don't want people to take on something that they don't think they can manage. But I think it's just that conversation. Could I manage this? And if I could, then let me find out as much as I can and find out where the resources are and find out who can support me. But for the most part, people don't walk in the door saying, mm, I'd like to adopt a child with special needs. And so they tend to be on that uh, list of people, of children at risk of aging out of care. And I like what you said there, because when you think about it, a child with special needs born into a family, for the most part, it, it's a family where, like you said, they have to figure out how they're going to best nurture and care for this child. So if you don't have any previous experience or knowledge of a child with special needs, that doesn't mm. discount you from adopting or fostering Absolutely. a child with special needs. Exactly, exactly. And the social workers are set up to make sure that they can help connect you to resources. They can help you understand what are the particular needs and, and uh, of this child and what has their journey been so far and what's their potential um, going forward. So absolutely, it is always a partnership too, you know, for all of the potential um, negative stereotypes about um, child welfare agencies look, they are staffed with people who want what's best for children. And so they want to help families get that for those children as well. Yes, and we must admit, we do hear about the negative stories. But I think if we are honest, we would actually stop and think, well, we hear, for every one story we hear, I'm sure there are tons that are good and doing the right thing. Because the truth is, we're not hearing these stories every day. We're hearing them once in a while about the negative um, aspects or the, the ones that are negatively affecting children. So I think sometimes we just really need to be logical about it and think, hold on a second. Yes, I heard this negative story. However, when was the last time I heard one? How often do I hear these? So it's not it's not an everyday, every person doing it thing. And I think if we're honest and we're again, we're sensible, we'll stop to think, unfortunately, sometimes that one has made it bad for the majority. Exactly, exactly. There's We've met so many wonderful people and look, we're engaged with nearly 500 of them across the United States mm -hmm. who are passionate and dedicated and go the extra mile. And particularly during the pandemic had to get very creative about making sure that their children on their caseloads didn't feel like they had been abandoned again because now they're in isolation. And so they came up with so many ways, creative ways to stay connected and even more connected perhaps than they were before because it's much easier to open up a laptop or, or turn on your phone and connect than to get in the car and drive 50 miles to go see the child. So I know, I know in my heart of hearts that no one goes into this business wanting to harm a child further. They want to help as much as they can. And we see it through Wendy's Wonderful Kids every day. Oh, that's wonderful. And that's good to know. So thank you so much. And I know that we touched on children and youth that age out, but is there anything in place for once a child ages out of foster care, is it literally like they're aged out and that's it? They're in the world by themselves or are there resources or support for these children still after that? There are organizations and resources. There are financial resources in most states for um, children who've either been adopted uh, as teens or who age out um, to help with college assistance. Um, there are there's a, a a group called Youth Villages that provides lots of resources and connectedness for kids who age out. So there are there there are never enough. Um, and, and some states uh, and some areas of states don't have the kind of um, robust resources that others do. But yes, th there certainly are resources out there and, and um, organizations that are working hard to make sure that those kids can stay connected, can keep moving forward as well. Um, absolutely. Oh, that's good. And, that's it. and can you repeat the names of a couple of those organizations, please? 
Sure, there's a group called Youth Villages. Um, there are, uh, if you go on, on, I think on our website, there's a list of resources. There's um, a, a beginner's guide to adoption, uh, post-adoption, and there's some organizations listed in there. Um, and there are, you know, if you go to um, uh, Health and Human Resources, the um, um, the section on child welfare, there's all kinds of resources on financial assistance for students, th those kinds of things that are available to, to kids. Excellent, thank you so much for that. And if someone is interested in fostering or fostering to adopt, what advice can you give them? What should they do? First, we say research, research, research. There's so much online. Really dig in and get a sense. You know, you're going to get all kinds of opinions, and, and but you'll begin to call through that and really get a sense of what this is, um, and really do a, 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 a an analysis of your family. What is it that I'm looking for? You know, am I looking to just foster? Do I want to foster on an emergency basis and just have you know? babies and children's and, and, and teenagers come in and out fairly quickly on a temporary placement? Am I looking for a longer term placement? Is my house suitable for just one child or, or sibling groups? Um, uh, and then connect with the agency in your area, whether it's a state agency or a private agency, because they have a list of things that you have to do in order to become a licensed foster parent or licensed to adopt as well. Um, and, and, and reach out and make that phone call and get connected to classes and get connected to the fact that you'll have to go through a home study that makes sure that you're safe to foster and adopt. Um, we've got a beginner's guide to adoption on the DaveThomasFoundation.org website that walks people through the sort of 10 steps of, of fostering and adopting as well. Um, and, and reach out, you know, ask the agency once you get connected, if you can talk to other foster parents and learn from their experiences if you don't know anyone um, that has fostered or adopted from foster care before. And once you amass all that information, then you're probably ready to say, yep, I really do want to do this or I need to wait for a few more months until, mm -hmm. you know, things settle down here. But it's really important to do that internal scrutiny to say, what is it that I really want? I want to first help a child, but here's how I want to do that. And here's what's going to be best both for my family and for the child. There are all kinds of resources online and on the DaveThomasFoundation.org. Thank you so much for sharing that because as we said earlier on the, um, during this conversation that so many people are just scared by it because we've heard all the horror stories of all the ho literally hoops you have to jump through. So thank you for actually breaking it down and making it sound much easier than it is. It, it's still a process. Let's not, you know, we'll, we'll acknowledge that. But it's not as daunting as I think many people think it is. And that's what stops them from actually making that step to say, OK, I'm going to really forge ahead and foster and or adopt and so with the Wendy's wonderful kids what does the future look like for the found Dave Thomas Foundation will you be expanding branching out into other areas what is next we are, we're expanding the program as we speak. Um, about four years ago, we were able to partner with a, a significant um, um, philanthropic partner that is allowing us to take this program to scale. And what that means is previously we were, we were privately funding through donations and gifts, um, you know, one or two recruiters in a state. And that was great for that caseload of 15 children per recruiter that were able to take um, advantage of that. But in some states there are, you know, 800, 1,000 children that qualify for this service. And so this philanthropic support is allowing us to approach states and come up with a new strategy of co-investment of the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption and the state saying, in order to serve these children best, we have to work together as partners. And then we can take this program to scale so that in a state like Ohio, we now have 56 recruiters across the state that are serving children. Or in a state like Kentucky, there are more than 60 recruiters across the state serving children. And once that program is taken to scale and embedded, then it becomes business as usual. And it's not unique. It's just, this is how we do business for this target population of children. So we're currently scaled in about 10 states. 
Our goal uh, is to have it scaled in all 50 states by 2028. We hope that we'll be there. And so we're continuing to grow our financial resources through our fundraising and through our relationships with other philanthropic partners. Um, but we're also continuing to grow the foundation so that the staff can um, uh, not miss steps so that we can effectively train and manage and, and support these more than 500 recruiters and soon maybe double that across the United States and Canada. So we're excited about that. We're excited to get back together after the pandemic and really um, be on uh, full steam ahead as a team, making sure that this service simply is available for every child that can benefit from it. That sounds absolutely wonderful. And I am absolutely sure you guys will achieve that goal especially when you had mentioned about the statistics and how you've managed to shift the numbers of children nine and up um, being adopted and fostered. So no doubt you guys will absolutely knock that out of the park. So that, that is great. And I'm looking forward to being able to see the growth and the expansion. And can I just ask, what other programs does the foundation offer? Other Because I know you've got Wendy's Wonderful Kids, and but what else do you have? We've got a couple of other signature programs that are important in terms of supporting this notion of adoption. So one of them is the Adoption Friendly Workplace Program. We talk to businesses and say, look, if you offer businesses to families that are formed, or if you offer benefits to um, families that are formed through birth, what do you think about offering benefits that are to families that are formed through adoption. It feels like a matter of equity. We understand that birth is a medical issue. So that's a, that's a different conversation. But if you're offering time off, if you're offering some financial benefits, then think about doing that for families that are formed through adoption. And we also have a 100 best adoption friendly workplace list that we um, put out every year to really recognize those businesses that step forward. And that's a growing list. So businesses are really picking up this notion that it's a matter of equity. It doesn't cost that much, um, but it's something important to do to show that you're a family friendly workplace, whether you're a large corporation or a tiny nonprofit. Oh, so there's that, there's that yeah, and then we're also the lead founders and funders of the National Adoption Day Initiative. Every year, the Saturday before Thanksgiving is celebrated as National Adoption Day. And this program started as just a germ of an idea and, and some activity in Los Angeles, where they were just, they had families that were all ready to finalize the adoption in court, but the backlog was so great that they had a backlog of months before that, that court hearing could happen and the adoption could be finalized. They started opening their court on Saturday and got volunteer attorneys and everybody in the court and, and got those adoptions moving. And we saw that more than 20 years ago and said, there's a germ of an idea here and worked together with some national partners and created what we decided was National Adoption Day that should be celebrated like Mother's Day or Father's Day. And it, it, it helps to both raise awareness because we get a lot of you know local press on it. This family was adopted on National Adoption Day or sometime around National Adoption Day. And there was a celebration on that day. Um, and so it works to just normalize this conversation look, you know, if the family down the street can be a part of National Adoption Day, maybe we can step in and do this too. So more than 75,000 children have been over the past 20 years adopted in or, or around National Adoption Day. Um, and it's just something where we have events now in all 50 states and, and uh, Puerto Rico and Guam. So it's just caught on as a grassroots community-based effort that celebrates adoption in all of its forms. It doesn't have to just be foster care adoption. Yeah. Sounds absolutely wonderful. And I really like the idea of that because the truth is, it is it's a big deal, isn't it? Being adopted yeah. into a family is a big deal. For the children, it's an absolute dream come true. And for some of these, the, the parents, for them, uh, especially those that couldn't have their own children, it's also yeah. a dream come true for them because they thought I'll never be a parent, but the truth is you can. So I'm loving the sound of National Adoption Day and what it actually represents and stands for. That I, I really love that. Thank you so much. So of course, how can people support the foundation? 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, certainly a number of ways, um, just getting your hands on the resources that we have and learning more about this cause of foster care adoption is so significant to us. But if people are so moved to provide financial assistance to us as a nonprofit organization, more than 90 cents of every dollar that comes into the foundation goes back out into programs and services. So we try to keep things pretty lean and mean and make sure that those dollars are used on behalf of children, both for awareness activities and programs like when Wendy's Wonderful Kids and National Adoption Day. Um, and and there's, a, there's a link on the website where people can make a donation if they're so moved. Um, but they can also use their social media. We're pretty big on Twitter mm -hmm. and Facebook and Instagram and all of the, the social media sites. You know, just join on and join in the conversation and forward or like information that we send out because that helps create that national conversation as well. So, so many ways to help us. We're grateful for however people want to step in and do it. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I'll just share that the website is davethomasfoundation.org. So you can go to that website to um, make a donation or you can go there to download the adoption guide. Yes, they both can, excellent. They can both be found there. And that is where people can find you. So Rita, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me today. It's been so informative and you've, explained and cleared up some things in my mind that were great areas that I'd heard of but didn't have the full understanding and all I can do is just help you to raise the awareness because hopefully so many people will hear this and listen to this and share it and download it and go to your website and learn more because there are so many children I, that need love there's so many children that need a good home and there's so many people that can give that. Exactly, exactly. And, and it's, we're always thrilled and we celebrate every time that happens when a, when a family steps forward and adopts. So thank you. It's been my pleasure to talk with you and, and to share a little bit about the foundation. Um, I'm, I'm really honored to have been here today. Thank you so much for your time. And um, definitely I'm going to share this on my social media platforms so that hopefully that should we have this conversation again in another five years time, the statistics of and the numbers of the children, in fact, they, it won't even be a part of the conversation because it will just be normal. <laughs> That's what we're hoping, it will just be a normal thing. It's not anything that is a specialist topic because children of all ages, children of all needs are just being adopted without even a second thought. I just all exactly. the very best for the expansion and the programs mm -hmm. and projects that you do. Rita, thank you so much for joining me here on Conversations with Alice and Jay, The Journey to Here. Thank you. Thank you.